then we are ready to start uh, this lecture and uh, also of course remember assignment 3 which is to be delivered by tomorrow morning so uh, uh, I should have it when I come to work tomorrow uh, and then I hope to be able to evaluate it during the weekend and give you also the result and, and some uh, comments to your, uh, uh, your answers and then go through the solution on uh, the next lecture in uh, one week. Uh, and I will also then upload a uh, suggested uh, solution uh, which uh, with the answers to, to each of the, the sub-questions in the assignment. Uh, also, I have uh, uploaded uh, solutions for exams in 2010 and 11 in uh, Fronter, so you can see those. Uh, exam last year is uploaded, but the solution is not yet uploaded because I will probably go through at least some of these uh, questions on the last uh, lectures in, uh, yeah, in two weeks. So this is the third last lecture. Uh, and uh, uh, like you can see here, uh, your exam will be uh, in the same way. So of course the exam date will, will be another. The time is still uh, five hours from nine to two o'clock. Uh, and you will be able to bring all written and printed aids in, the sh in addition to a calculator. So you can have uh, your notes, you can have the textbook or uh, eventually uh, other aids. Uh, but of course, there will probably, for most of you, be a lot of work and it's not uh, possible to start looking after things if you don't know about the topics in, in advance on the exam day. So you should, of course, organize your notes and you should be, uh, well, study the textbook so you can use it as uh, uh, to look up. You don't have to memorize the formulas and so on, so you can look them up, but uh, you should be able to... to uh, uh, to use them and uh, use the aids uh, uh, and, and organize the aids in, in, in advance so you don't have to uh, search for things if you don't know exactly where you have those notes. Also some uh, general advice, yeah, uh, language will be one Norwegian exam and one English uh, exam so you can choose. Uh, the questions will of course be the same but uh, there are uh, uh, one version in English and one in, uh, in Norwegian. Uh, also some uh, general advice here, which also of course is uh, relevant for your exam, uh, very important, read through the complete program, uh, pr problem text before you start to answer, so you are sure that you know all the details, you, you shouldn't just start, uh, uh, start trying to solve anything before you have read the text, because then suddenly when you read the rest of the, the question you find out that you actually have done something which is not necessary or did something which was not exactly correct, which you would find out if you read through the, t the complete text. Uh, what is also important here, all the sub-problems will count equally for the final grade of the exam. Usually there will be around 20 sub-problems and then each of them will count for 5%. Some of them are very easy, some of them are very difficult and complex and time-consuming. So it's very important, try to manage the time and uh, first of all answer the easy questions first and then try to answer the more difficult questions as good as possible and then it's better to answer many problems partial than only a few perfect. Because if you, even if you're not able to solve all the problems, you can show the uh, method, you can uh, uh, can show that you, you at least you understand which method and uh, what you should do to solve such a problem, then you will, uh, will get some, uh, some credit for that, even if you're not uh, solving everything uh, perfect. Uh, so, well, this uh, is a some kind of time limitation on, on an exam, but the, uh, the important thing here is to, to show that you are able to, to solve uh, such uh, problems and you know how to, to solve them. So, I will again stress this one, all sub-problems will count equally for the final grade of the exam. Try to answer as many questions as possible, at least partial, and then 
you should manage the time so you can try to, uh, to finalize and do the last, uh, last step and, and uh, utilize all the time. A rough sheet will not be graded. You have to fill in on the uh, exam uh, sheets. And uh, so you should not hand in the, the rough sheets with your paper because we are not allowed to, to use those in uh, the grading process. Uh, yeah. As mentioned, uh, solutions for exam for 2010 and 11 is already uploaded in front there. You can have a look at them and uh, to see uh, well, problem type and uh, get some, some tips on, uh, on answers. And last year's exam, I will uh, also present a solution for this one, but I will uh, first try to solve some of the problems in, in the lectures, probably in, in two weeks. So you should try to prepare, look through the exam set and uh, uh, prepare and uh, then uh, uh, well at least think how you should uh, how, how you would uh, solve some of these problems uh, because then you will be better prepared and, and you should be better able to, to understand when I show the solution on the, on the last lecture. Okay then today we will uh, continue on chapter 7 which we started last week. I showed uh, different methods to solve uh, the so-called lot sizing problem, uh, which you are sh also should use in, in your assignment. The silver meal <laughs> method, the uh, part period balancing, and the least unit co cost method was presented uh, last week. Uh, today I will go through some more theory on this type of push and pull uh, production control uh, system, uh, and also show give some theory and also show some, some other methods how this can, can be solved. And then I will present the last lecture note on lingo, where you also are able to formulate these lot sizing problems as an LP problem, to which uh, could be solved to optimality using uh, an, uh, some optimizer software like, uh, like lingo. And I will also present uh, very shortly how you can uh, simplify and use some programming, uh, data programming techniques to make uh, programs which uh, makes it uh, well, easier to, uh, to formulate and solve large problems of, of these types in an optimizer like, uh, like Lingo. Uh, then we have also chapter 8 left in the curriculum which is regarding scheduling. I might be able to start it today. Uh, I will certainly uh, continue uh, next week. Uh, but also next week I will present the solution for, uh, for the assignment, so we will see how much it will take. But uh, the scheduling topic is also very relevant and will certainly be uh, represented on, on the exam, even if you have not uh, had uh, these types of problems in any of, of the assignments. Okay, then back to this chapter seven, push and pull control system, and first some basic definitions. Here we have two, what we call strategies or philosophies. One is the so-called push system, uh, and another one is the pull system, and an example on the push system is what we call the MRP, materials requirements planning which is the basic process of translating a production schedule for an end product. This will then be called the MPS, the Master Production Schedule. And this, uh, this will be uh, trans uh, translated to a set of requirements for all of the sub-assemblies and parts which is needed to make an item. So here on the MRP system, we are making a plan and we are uh, estimating how much we need of raw materials, different types of components, sub-assemblies, parts and so on. So we are making a plan. What do we actually need to finish a product? Um, uh, and, and then the product is, uh, is made according to, to a plan, what we need. This could be found like uh, uh, by putting up a forecast, for example. What do we need? What is, is the forecast for the coming period? Uh, the other philosophy 
the opposite uh, philosophy in some way is called the GIT, the just in time. And this is derived from the, uh, the original Kanban system used by the car producer Toyota in, in Japan. And here they will try to deliver the philosophy here is to deliver the right amount of a product at the right time. And then the goal here is to reduce the work in, in process to an absolute minimum. Ideally, you should have nothing, everything should go smoothly. So instead of using a plan, production plan, like we do in the MRP or the push systems, we are pulling inventory, pulling components exact, ex exactly at the time we need them. So everything is initialized by a final order. Uh, of course, you have to plan this in, in advance, but in this uh, uh, philosophy here, if the car producer, Toyota, get an order of a car, that will initialize the production, which is finishing the, the step before, which is finalizing the car, which is again when you get the order from the, uh, the pre predecessor uh, or the workstation, which is next in line, when you get the order, you are allowed or you should then start to produce or, uh, uh, or order the different components and the sub-assemblies that you need to finish this, uh, uh, this product. So here in the MRP, we are pushing inventory into the system, we are trying to meet a plan for production in the just-in-time philosophy. We are rather pulling inventory when we actually need it to try to reduce the working process as much as, as possible. Uh, in this course, we will focus on the MRP, Material Requirement Planning, or the push strategy. We are looking at different production plans according to the forecast or the needed uh, amount of, uh, of products in the certain uh, uh, time period. So we will not ju uh, focus very much on that just in time, but you should know about the difference, the two different philosophies here. MRP is the push uh, philosophy and just in time is the pull uh, philosophy. And also some more theory here. MRP, as mentioned, classic push system. Computes production schedules for all level based on forecast of sales of end items. And we will later uh, today look at the uh, so-called explosion calculus where we are creating diff plans for different levels of assemblies, sub-assemblies and components and so on based on the forecast, what we actually think we will need in the coming periods. And when once uh, produced, the sub-assemblies are pushed to the next level, whether they are needed or not. So here, in this case, we might have inventories. We might have inventories of raw materials. We might have inventories of end items, finished products, but also at the different workstation, different uh, production uh, places, we might have some assemblies, some partly finished products. And in opposite, the just-in-time, the classic pull system, where the basic mechanism is that the production at one level only will happen when it's initiated by a request at the higher level, the next workstation in, uh, in the production line. And then we are pulling units or uh, items through the system only by request. <coughs> so, uh, also here, some comparison between these two methods. They are completely different approaches to the production planning, two completely uh, different ways of, of looking at the, at the production line. And each will have some kind of advantages over the other, but neither seem to be sufficient on its own. Because here we have different industries, different products, and in some industries it's uh, better to have a plan uh, like uh, an MRP system. In others it is uh, possible and uh, 
uh, and, and okay to use the just in time or the, the pull principles to only to initiate uh, production when you actually need the components. So here, the main advantage of the MRP will then be that you take the forecast for the end product and in an environment where there are substantial variation of sales and you can actually forecast these variations, you will have an advantage of this uh, by using this MRP system. If you have orders given, the, the orders can be placed a uh, well, long time ahead, uh, and you have different amounts for different weeks, for example, then you will have to make a plan using an MRP system. Uh, and in uh, opposite, the just-in-time will then reduce the inventory to a minimum. And here, ad in addition to save direct inventory carrying cost, we also have some substantial side benefits, such as the improvement in quality and also in plant uh, efficiency. Uh, and uh, then the just-in-time will be better if you have a relatively stable demand here in the MRP, you might have a variation of sales from one period, maybe one week to, to another. Uh, when just in time is, uh, has the advantage, then you don't have very much variation. You have a relatively stable production and you should be able to, to make a smooth production line that everything is going smoothly and you don't have much storage of, uh, of inventory in, uh, uh, from the first uh, workstation or, or first uh, place in, in the production line until the product is finished. <coughs> uh, as mentioned, we will now focus most on the MRP. You should be aware of the just-in-time philosophy. Sh you should know about it, but the methods we will see here and also the method I presented last week, the silver meal, the part period balancing and least unit cost methods, they are based on the MRP. Uh, principles where you actually have a known or a forecasted demand which is different from one week or one period to the next one. And here the MRP system will start with the so-called MPS, the Master Production Schedule, which is a forecast for the sales of the end item over the planning horizon. And you might have the sources for creating this MPS schedule. One is the customer orders, what you actually have. Some customers have ordered a certain amount to be delivered in uh, a certain uh, time period. Uh, you can, in addition to what you have, the orders which is placed, uh, or, uh, orders uh, that, that are placed, of course, and then you might also use the forecast of the future demand using a forecasting methods, which we have looked on earlier in, in this course. Uh, you might have some requirements of a safety stock, that you should have some stock to prevent for a stock out if you have a high demand in, in some periods. And also seasonal variations is quite important to, to consider here when you should create this MPS uh, uh, schedule. And of course also internal orders from other parts of the organizations need to be uh, considered here. Uh, to create a master production schedule, we also use the so-called Bill of Materials, the BOM, which is also based on the forecast. And here we will look at the explosion calculus, which is a set of rules for converting the master production schedule to requirement schedule for all sub-assemblies. So here we assume that, uh, or in, in this case, uh, where you use these systems, you have a product which consists of several other sub-assemblies or components which needs to be put together for the final product. And then you have a plan uh, or some rules of converting the schedule to a requirement schedule for all these sub-assemblies or components and also raw materials that is necessary to produce the item. And we have two basic operations here. One is the time phasing, which is the requirement for the lower level item, 
which must be shifted backwards by the lead time required to produce the items. Or eventually, if you have to order from an external vendor, you will also have a lead time for, uh, for delivering. So here, if you have one given time period where the finished products should be finished, uh, should be delivered, then you need to use time phasing to find out when do we actually need the different sub-assemblies, the different components, which is a part of the final product. And we also need to use the uh, operation of multiplication, which is a multiplicative factor, which must be applied when more than one sub-assembly is required for each higher level item. So we have both the time phasing to make sure that we have all the components at the correct time and also the multiplication factor that we need to consider if the same components is used in, uh, by more, more than one in the final uh, product. So we can then create the product structure diagram which is a graphical representation of the relationship between the various levels of the productive system and it incorporates all the information necessary to implement the explosion calculus. And then we should look at the figure, which here will decide two levels. You have the final item here, the end item, the finished products which you can sell to your customers. And to produce one of these end items, you need two um, components A, which has one week of, of lead time in this case, <coughs> and one of component B, which has a two weeks of lead time in this example. And then again, to produce the sub-assembly or component A, we actually need some other uh, components at a lower level, which is here called the C and the D. And for one item of the sub-assembly A, we need one item of the component C with a two week of lead time and two items of co component D with one week of lead time. And similar, for sub-assembly B, we need two of component C, same components as this one, with two weeks of lead time, and also three, new, uh, three of a new component E, which has a two weeks of lead time. So here we have the first, the end item, or the finalized product. Then we have the parent level, which here is called the level one, and you have child level which is level two. And so you can have more complex products with even more level here. So you can then assume that the components here also will consist of different smaller uh, components, which needs to, be, um, needs to be planned to make sure that you have, uh, you have sufficient of each of the components at every level when you actually need them according to the production plan. So here, if we now want to find out what we need, we know that uh, for each end item, if we should now produce one item of, of this uh, product, we need uh, one, or sub-assembly A, will need one of um, yeah, first we need, uh, we need two of A for the final product <coughs> and the item needs two times A and one times B according to the figure here. And <coughs> then for producing the sub-assembly A we also need one of component C and two of component D. Uh, which means that uh, 
A will then be 1 times C and 2 times D. And B needs 2 times C and 3 times E. So here we need first to plan for component C, which means for every item we need two multiplied by, in this case, one, because you need one of item C to make one sub-assembly uh, A. So two, which again needs two in the, in the finished product, so you need two times one, plus what we see here that C also needs two in sub-assembly B. So here we need two for each sub-assembly here, but the end item only need one of the sub-assembly B. which in total will be four. So for every end item, we need four of component C. For component D, we can see that we need two of component D for each sub-assembly A. And for the end item, we need two of sub-assembly A. So in total for the end item, we need two times two of uh, component D, which still is 4, and for subassembly E, we will then need 3 for each subassembly B, which is needed once in the end item, like this. So this is now what we actually need to create one final product. We need four component C, four component D, and three component E. And to create the final plan, we also need to consider the lead time, which here is given as two weeks, and here one week. So what we need is two weeks before the end item should be uh, finished, or we should deliver this B sub assembly to the uh, end item workstation. Uh, two weeks before that, we should have available two of item C and three of item E. And each of these will also have two weeks of, uh, uh, of lead time. So we need to start this planning or this uh, production four weeks before they should be delivered at the end item workstation. So here, 2 plus 2, 2 plus 2, here 1 plus 1, so here we have some, some well, spare time, and 2 plus 1. So here the critical timeline is on this side here, which means that you need to start planning this product four weeks in advance. Uh, then, we also, last week, talked about the lot for lot, or the L for L system, uh, or, uh, or planning uh, strategy, which means that the requirements are met on a period by period basis. That we are planning, or producing, or ordering, to have exactly what we need in each period. And if we define a period to be one week, we should, in the lot for lot <coughs> strategy, uh, order or pr produce exactly what we need in that week. We should not store anything from one week to the next week. But of course, this is not necessarily a very effective or you know, cost-effective uh, plan. So we have already seen some techniques, the silver meal, the part period balancing, and, and so on, which is able to effectivize more of this uh, uh, production. For producing or ordering more than we actually need in one week and store to the later <coughs> weeks, which will usually be a cheaper or a more cost-effective uh, strategy than the lot for lot strategy that says that we should 
uh, order or produce exactly what we need in each week. Uh, we should now look at one example which is also defined uh, or described in the textbook which is about producing a trumpet music instrument looking like this. And uh, to produce this product we actually have different components or different sub-assemblies here. And uh, a trumpet will consist of the so-called bell assembly, which is the bell, this part. And in addition to the bell, you will also have the valve casing uh, assembly, which is this part, with the exact valves and also the slide assemblies here. And we can see that we need three of these valves to create one wall uh, casing assembly and in addition we need to put it together with the bell of the trumpet. So here we can create this uh, trumpet wh which here is the final product and this trumpet will then consist of the bell and we need one bell to create one trumpet so here we can say that we need one of this and we also need one valve casing assembly and here the assembly is the assembly of these three valves so then we need actually also only one of the Of casing here, but then again to create this valve casing assembly, we need three valves, this, and also three valve cases, uh, which is now called the slide assembly here. So we have three valves. And we have also the what we call the, the slide assembly. So this is now the product structure diagram here. To create one trumpet, we need one bell. We need one valve casing assembly, which again will consist of three valves and three slides. And we can also look at the production time. So here we can assume that to create the bell we need two weeks. To create or put the valve casing assembly together we actually need four weeks. This should, of course, be up here to the bell, two weeks. Uh, but then, in addition to the four weeks, we need also here two weeks to produce the valves, these items. And we need three weeks to produce, no, this was three weeks. Three weeks to produce the valves and two weeks to produce the slides. Like this. So now, in this case, we need, we, if we have an order for a trumpet or a plan for finalizing one trumpet, we need to add four weeks, which is the production time or the lead time for the way valve casing assembly, and in addition, three weeks for producing the valves. So we need to plan this trumpet, one trumpet, four plus three, seven weeks in advance, in this case. <coughs> uh, 
So then the production time will be the max time, uh, the maximum time in line, which is the maximum in any of the, in this three structure, the maximum time in any of these uh, uh, lines, which can be found by using, looking at this product structure uh, diagram. If we are starting production today or in week one, we will have one finished trumpet after seven weeks. First three, or and then four. And then we assume that just putting these two assemblies together is a very simple uh, case, which doesn't uh, need much extra time. So let's now assume that we have a forecast. We know how many trumpets we need. We have a demand, and as we know, we have a demand for week number eight, because what is happening before is need to be, be planned, uh, planned before. So in week number eight, we might need eight. Now this is week number eight, of course, and then we, we can create a plan here for the coming weeks. And if we need 77 according to placed orders or forecast or whatever method we are finding, we are using. Then we have a demand here of 77 in week number eight. In week number nine, we are given 42 and then 38. And then 21 and 26, according to the example from, from the book. So this is now the demand for the coming weeks. And we are starting in week number eight because we know that we need seven weeks to finalize a trumpet. So what is happening before week number eight needs to be planned in, in advance, before uh, this by your, uh, the one previous in, in, in your job, for example. Uh, what we also need <coughs> to consider is the actual inventory. What do we have on inventory? Because sometimes we have already something which is produced earlier, which can be used to meet the demand. So here, in this example, we are also given information that we have already 23 trumpets on stock. And of course, then we can reduce the actual demand by 23 because we don't need to produce more than 77 minus 23. And also, we might have some other adjustment, some return from other customers uh, or from other parts of, of the company, uh, which is uh, transferred to your store. So let's call that adjustment. So here we uh, will also assume that we will have even 12 more in period number eight. Well, uh, uh, return from other customers and fixed and uh, also ready to, uh, to be sold again. Uh, and in addition, you have also s an adjustment of six in period number 10 and nine in period number 11 and nothing in 9 and 12. So this is given information from other parts of, of the, the company or the, the chain or uh, whatever you, you will get this uh, uh, new item from. So this is information that needs to be considered when you are creating the final production plan. So now we can uh, create a new line, which is now called the net demand, which is the adjusted demand. This is actually what we assume that we will sell, what we actually will need according to the orders which already are placed, and also from uh, uh, yeah, method like forecasting methods or, or anything. So what we actually need to produce is this demand, minus the inventory on stock and some other adjustment. 
77 minus 23 minus 12 should be 42. In period 9, we have a demand of 42 and no adjustments. In period 10, we have a demand of 38, but we have an adjustment of 6, which means that we only need 32. And in period 11, 21 minus 9 should be 12. And then 26 in period uh, number 12. So here we will create this line called the net demand, which is what we actually need to produce to meet the, the demand given here when we have adjusted by the inventory on stock and some other uh, adjustments. And then we know that for every trumpet which we need to produce in these amounts, we need one bell assembly which should be finished or planned two weeks before. We know that we need a trumpet in week number eight. That means two weeks before in week number six, we should produce one bell assembly. And we also need four weeks in advance, we need a valve, case, valve casing assembly. This part, which, which needs to be produced four weeks before week number eight, which means in week number four. And again, to produce this one, we need two weeks to produce three slides. And we need three weeks to produce three wolves. So the actual demand of wolves will be three times 42, 126. And you need to start producing in week number one because we need three weeks here and four weeks here to finish a trumpet in week number eight. So this is the time aspect. And this is also the multiplicative factor that we need three wolves. We need three or one component to finalize one final product. Okay, let's take a break and continue in 15 minutes. <clears throat>